Hello and welcome to another episode of the Podium Podcast. I'm Simon Hartley. And I'm Tom May. Over the years, I've heard hundreds, if not thousands of people talking about the power of translating sports thinking, elite sports thinking into business. And I think it's genuinely a fantastic concept. But the question is how? How do athletes translate their thinking into business? During the course of these shows, we're going to find out exactly how, what does work and what doesn't from some people who have been there and done it. Uh, today, we are joined by an amazing guest, uh, US Olympic boxer, Tommy Duquette. Welcome to the show, Tommy. Thank you so much. Yeah, just to clarify, I was not an Olympic boxer. I was um, on the US national team and fought in the Olympic trials, but I'm sure we'll get into all of that. Absolutely. I'm really interested in how you got into boxing and your journey up to the national team and up to the Olympic sort of program. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I love to cover that. So boxing for me is something that goes way back in my family history, uh, all the way back to the 1920s, as far as I know, at least. Uh, my great grandfather was a professional uh, boxer. He was a New England champion. And then he taught all his sons how to box. And uh, my grandfather as well, my mother's father, was a New England champion as well. Um, then it skipped a generation. He actually passed away when my mother was just a, a kid, so I never met him. But I always knew about that family history. Um, and it always sort of drew me towards the sport. And uh, the day that I walked into a boxing gym for the first time, I was about 14 years old. I actually went because I have a cousin who used to get in a lot of scraps in the street. He's a little bit older <laughs> than me. And the school didn't know what to do with him. So they're like, what do we do with this kid? He's always getting in fights. And he wasn't a bully. It wasn't like he was bullying people. It was more like, you know, he had a, a, a trigger, right? So they sent him to this boxing gym. And I tagged along one day because I was always curious. And um, I went to watch. I'm thinking, like, you know, he's going to go there and fight, you know, on day one of entering a boxing gym. And anybody who knows that culture knows the, that's not really the thing. You know, you got to pay your dues. So I went to watch. The trainer saw me, he's like, he was only expecting him. He's like, what are you doing here, kid? You know? And I'm like, oh, I'm here to watch. And he threw a jump rope at me. He was basically like, leave, get out of here, or start jumping rope. And then, you know, here I am decades later. So, How did that first, how did that first session of uh, jumping rope go? I mean, I, that, is the, that, <laughs> that is the hardest thing I've ever done. <laughs> for, for most people, the first session doesn't go that well. <laughs> so... So how did you kind of move from, uh, you know, entering a gym to start with to actually getting into the U.S. national team and making Olympic trials? Because that's that's quite a journey. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it was easy. You know, no, I'm kidding. It was, um, <laughs> it was very hard. So, you know, it starts at, at 14 years old and you go through all the motions as, you know, somebody who comes up as a fighter from like never sparring before sparring for the first time getting hurt for the first time in the ring and wondering like, is this still what I want to do? All the ups and downs along the way. So for me, through the years, like there's, if you're going to be successful in boxing, which I don't even consider, a lot of people consider me that I was successful as an athlete. Even I look back and I'm kind of disappointed. I'm like, ah, oh, I didn't make the Olympic team. I didn't win a medal. I didn't, I decided not to turn professional, but you, you go through all kinds of like gut checks throughout the, throughout the years so you know you'll train for a tournament let's say and you'll do well and then maybe you'll lose and like is this for me you'll get hurt you'll get injured you know for me um I remember a moment where I got my my eye fractured right here I got a little hairline fracture in my eye man is this for me but I think what makes you successful in boxing it's very different than other sports it's not just athleticism you have to have some degree of that it's grit you have to be able to get up time and time and time again. It's almost like you have to be a little crazy, right? Have a fractured eye and say, I'm going to go back in there and do it again. But, you know, for me, I, through the years, I would have a little degree of success. You know, maybe I'd win a state championship. You know, I'd win some fights, golden gloves, local golden gloves. And then, you know, maybe a period of like, okay, I have to rebuild to get to the next level. And then I became a New England champion. Um... From there, I became a regional champion, which the New England region, there is a place called New England. There's not just England, of course. <laughs> and, uh, there's Boston, where the I'm from. You, you've got the better version, probably. Right. <laughs> well, <laughs> you've got the original version, you know. <laughs> you've definitely but, got yeah, the better NFL team, that's for sure. 
The NFL, yeah, yeah 100%. That's, that's what we consider football over here. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I grew up in greater Boston, that whole area, uh, Cambridge, Boston, Waltham. And um, I um, – what was I getting at? I was getting at something here until I took the shot at, at Old England. Let me think. Mm. You, you were telling oh, us your about process, your process through. through. Mm. Right, the process through, yeah. So became a, a New England champion, which was amazing, right? And, and um, you know, just continued to go head first into it. And it was never enough. I think that, that's the thing for me. I think it's a lot of successful athletes, especially those that are able to transfer that into other aspects of their life. It's like, it's, it breeds success to never be satisfied, but it also kind of is uh, not healthy either. So I would win something and I'd tell myself like, man, if I was a New England boxing champion, just like my great grandfather, my grandfather, like I'd be happy. Like I can, you know, maybe stop boxing or whatever. And I'd be happy with my accomplishments. And then you get there and you're like, man, this is not enough. Like I have to be, um, you know, nationally ranked. I have to be a national champion. I have to be an Olympian. And at some point in time, I did. I, I think I had some self-awareness that that's never going to stop. But um, I think that's what drove me too, you know. So in uh, 2008 was the first time that I became nationally ranked in the top 10. Um, I had went and fought in the nationals, and there were some killers in my weight class that year. I remember, obviously, Jamel Herring, who's a world champion. He beat. Um, I think he beat Carl Frampton for the belt. Who's, 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 I, I think Carl Frampton might be from Ireland. Hmm. Um, I'm not sure if you guys are aware. And then you have, um, who else? A kid named Frankie Gomez, uh, who was lights out. He retired undefeated from professional boxing. He probably could be the world champion right now. He just decided it wasn't for him anymore. One of the best prospects in boxing. Uh, Jose Benavides, David Benavides' brother. So all those guys in my weight class that year. And yeah, that was the first year I became nationally ranked. And then in the years from 2008, it was right after the Olympics in 2008, leading up to the London Games in 2012, I would just continue to like the following year, I'd climb up the rankings more. The next year after that, climb up the rankings more. And then right uh, the year of the Olympics in London, I was the number two seed in the U.S. Olympic trials. And that was the goal to become an Olympian, to come visit uh, you guys, my friends over there in, in England. And um, I came up just short in the Olympic trials in 2011. I actually lost on a tiebreaker in the Olympic trials, which is uh, you know, probably the smallest mark, or definitely the smallest margin you could lose by. And that was it for me. Yeah. Mm. Tommy, one of the things I want to ask you, um, like with some sports, there's uh, there are some inherent traits that you have to have as a, a to, mm. to make it to the top. It, with mm. boxing, I, you know, I've not I've not come across too many boxers, so I, I've never really had the opportunity to ask. Like, mm. do you have to be? Um, you obviously have to have a, na a natural level of fitness that, that means you can kick on. Because you know, when I've been been chucked some gloves in a preseason uh, for you know within my sport rugby, I, I can understand how difficult it must get. Is there? Do you have to have that backed up by a natural aggression, or is that something you can bring into the sport? Um, what are the what are the sort of individual traits that you have to have to make you a good boxer? I mean, I think there's different ones, and, and different fighters have different mix of attributes. But to me, I'll tell you, I think the most important attribute, um, and I think this goes for any sport, is brain speed, and I think it's one of the most overlooked. I don't think people look at athletes that are good and they don't realize that it's their brain speed that is actually making them that good. They'll look at somebody, they'll say, man, that person is, is fast, right? But throughout the years, I've seen a lot of fighters who have tremendous hand speed. And Amir Khan is a perfect example. He's such a talent. It's amazing from, from your neck of the woods, right? Mm -hmm. And you yeah. see him fight Canelo. And he's hand speed wise, you know, 10 times faster than Canelo. And it showed early in the fight. When you watch him fight Canelo, Canelo's downloading it. It's like he downloads something. He's just like taking in every single data point, and then he's getting closer and closer and closer, and then he gets uh, Amir Khan to, to commit to something. He reads it, and then boom, he catches him and knocks him out. And that's a perfect example of even though Amir Khan, was, his hands were faster, Canelo's brain was faster. 
and he picked up on something that that Amir Khan wasn't able to pick up on and won for that reason. So that was something that I was blessed with a, a very fast reflexes and really good brain speed and, and hand speed, average power, <laughs> definitely probably below average lungs to be completely honest. That was my, uh, my detriment. Um, I had uh, asthma as a kid, so that probably uh, worked against me. But those were probably my best attributes personally. But when you look at fighters, there's different things. So some people just mm -hmm. have tremendous punching power and the ability to sort of withstand punishment. So they might not be fast. They might have average brain speed, but they'll win for that reason. Yeah. yeah. So I, those, I, guess, I, I guess aggression could get in the way of that, right? Because that clouds your mental clarity. And, you know, if you get red mist, you're just probably going to get clobbered back. You know, I think aggression is good. It's necessary. Um, but you can't have just that and not some of the other attributes. So if you have aggression, you have great punching power and you have the ability to, to take abuse, which is actually, you know, it's probably not the best attribute to have just by itself. You know, it's what gets a lot of fighters hurt, but some fighters can just take a lot of punishment. And because of that, if they lack, you know, reflexes and things like that, they, they will. They'll just take abuse, get inside and, you know, unleash their power. So aggression can definitely be helpful. Long term in your career, it can hurt you, but it can definitely help you win fights. Mm. There was something that you said there that was in, incredibly insightful, I think, which is that the understanding that you you could always be hungry, if you know what I mean. It doesn't matter how much success you've got, you're always hungry because there's always something more. Um, and, and I've seen lots of athletes who are really single-mindedly focused on their goal, on their prize. Um, they are incredibly driven, but at the same time, they're miserable because they will always be hungry. It doesn't matter how many gold medals, how many trophies they pick it up, etc. Uh, it will never be enough. And I think it, it, that's a huge uh, insight and a huge uh, sort of bit of awareness to have um, as you're coming through. Um, you mentioned you made a choice. I know quite a lot of um, GB Olympic boxers who have chosen to go into professional boxing, but you chose a completely different route. You chose to go into business. Can you tell us a, a bit about the business and also the sort of spark of inspiration that, that led you into the business? Yeah, for sure. I, you know, I can't think of the original spark. I, I just, I, I think since I was a kid, I was always really interested in entrepreneurship, not just business, but entrepreneurship. The idea of sort of like striking out on your own, you know, I mean, that's who we are, right? We left the great island of, of the United Kingdom. We got on boats and that's, those were our ancestors and we came over here. I think it's a little bit of that in uh, all of us Americans. But I've always been, been fascinated by the idea of like being my own boss, right? Mm -hmm. uh, putting it all on the line, you know, gambling and, and, and hopefully winning, but being, you know, completely aware that I, I could lose. But putting that those stakes up because it's worth it, right? So I've always been interested in entrepreneurship and business. And, you know, one of the things that led me down the path that I'm at is I was going to a school called uh, Babson College. And while I was there in my final year, I was exposed to um, this internship with a venture capital fund called Highland Capital. And there was a guy there named Bob Davis who was like, sort of like the leader of our group, the mentor. He, he was the partner at the, um, the VC fund. We have very little interaction with them, but the interaction we did have, he was the founder of Lycos. If you remember, Lycos was one of the first ever search engines. And I remember thinking to myself, like, whatever that guy does, like, that guy's the man. I want to do that. So as I was going along in my boxing journey, I had all these different moments where I was like, and the first one was like, hey, you know, I really want to get an education because at first I wasn't going to college. I didn't do well in high school, right? And I'd always promised my grandmother that I would go to college. So that was one moment for me. Um, and then when I got to college, it was very much like, hey, this is not just like high school. This is actually a competition. And I want to apply the same mentality that I had towards boxing to this. All these other people in the classroom are trying to get a good grade. They're trying to outcompete me. And this has real life consequences down the road. So I applied that. And then from there, I started a community college. I was able to transfer to the school called Babson, right? And the reason I went to that school was because it's a very small business school in, um, you know, in the Boston area, known for entrepreneurship, you know, so like Home, Home Depot founder, um, Gerber Baby Food, um, so many businesses, Viking, um, mm. Toyota, 
you know, the uh, Henry Ford's son, like so many people had gone there and gone on to build business empires and it's the size of a high school. You know, which is in the U.S. A high school is uh, grades um, nine through twelve, right? You're yeah. you're you know fourteen, fifteen to to eighteen, and it's tiny. It's a tiny college. And the reason I I, I learned about these places because I was washing windows in the summers as a summer job, and then a little bit after high school. And my boss at the time was this older guy, and uh, he you know he had some degree of success he with this window cleaning business, and and we drive around you know washing the windows of the people in this neighborhood. And he'd, he'd always point to that school and he'd be like, that's where the big shots go right there. So I always had my eyes drawn in that school, went to that school and did really well, met that guy through that internship. And I'm like, oh, okay, like this is the field to be in. And it just seemed like a lot of things were aligning around uh, tech. You have, you know, obviously the Facebook story of a lot of young people really striking out on their own. It was like the gold rush of our time. You know, in the 1800s, everybody going west to strike it rich with gold. Uh, that's like our generation's gold rush is, is tech entrepreneurship. And I, I wanted to be a part of that. Brilliant. Yeah. Uh, so the idea for the business, how, how did it um, sort of grow? If it wasn't a spark, how did it grow? What, um, how, how did you come to the point of thinking, yeah, fight camp, that's, that's where I'm going here? Yeah, yeah. So... The genesis of the business starts even before that I joined. It was the punch trackers, the technology. And my co-founders, uh, Kobe O, who's our CEO, and Alex, who's our CTO, they had bootstrapped their way, um, which is like startup lingo for like not taking any investment money, just using their own money and friends and family helping them out and things like that, to having this working prototype of these punch trackers. And Khalil, who's our, you know, our current CEO, my co-founder, he had reached out to me when they were in the process of like trying to figure out how to, how to turn this into a business because like in his words, I was probably the only person he found on LinkedIn that had this background in boxing where I was you know nationally ranked and all this experience, but also had this like uh, interest in technology business and a little bit of experience and had gone to a school where I studied that. So he linked up with me online, online because we had these similar interests and um, we started you know talking back and forth he came down to Boston. He's from Montreal, which is a five-hour drive, five, five or six-hour drive. He came down to meet one day. We got along. I introduced him around. And then shortly thereafter, he's like, man, join us on this, this, this journey. At the time, I was actually working on a different business, which was a rough go. Um, so it took a couple months of convincing, but he's a pr pretty convincing guy. <laughs> and um, I ended up joining them in 2015 the winter I want to say of 20 or the fall of 2015 at first remotely uh, and then we got accepted to Y Combinator which is a startup accelerator out here in the US it's actually the number one startup accelerator it's like the Harvard of early stage venture funding mm -hmm. you know Airbnb Dropbox and Stripe and a lot of these companies you've heard of today went through Y Combinator so wow. we got accepted to that and it moved us all out for the first time. We were working in this, uh, this house in a place called Los Altos Hills um, in Northern California. And yeah, we've just gone from there. Fantastic. Really? Amazing yeah. story, that. And that was mm. just the punch trackers, too. Yeah, the, the punch trackers, you know, which is how I met our friend, our mutual friend, Justin. There, that was a brand that we called Hixo, H-Y-K-S-O. And Khalil had named it after... There was like an ancient people that were known, like in the time of like the Egyptians, they were known for innovating warfare technology. So they invented the chariot, right? So it's like, it's kind of like warfare technology, thought it was a cool name. So that's where that name came from. Really cool business. And we were chasing that, like we were selling them to professional athletes and, you know, coaches and um, trying to do a deal with like the sports network so that we could put stats on screen while you're watching live fights. Mate, we're thinking like, oh, we could sell this to the betting community. So really cool business, but uh, not a good business. Mm. Yeah. So, does that, 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 those ideas uh, floundered, did they? Or why did, why did they not work? You know, I don't want to say they didn't work because I actually think they could work, right? Well, a couple things. Don't sell to professional athletes if you want to start a product because professional athletes number one. <laughs> They want it for yeah. free. <laughs> There's not a lot of them and they want it for free. 
So even if you could sell it to them, there's not even a big market there. And, you know, we wanted it. So Khalil um, was really into boxing. Uh, obviously, I was really into boxing. So we were like looking at this product. We over-engineered it. Like, it's not accurate enough. We got to make it more accurate, more accurate, more accurate, right, to serve these professional athletes because they have high demands. And we chased that down for a while. And, yeah, it's just, we found it's just not a great market. And then on the broadcast side with the stats, I think that's a pretty viable business. Maybe not standalone, but – it could be a standalone business. I really do think so. Just not humongous, but it's a, definitely a very viable business. But the sales cycle there will kill a startup. You know, as a technology yeah. startup, you need a lot of funding to uh, get through manufacturing of the hardware, you know, to grow and stuff. And, you know, let's call it HBO or Showtime. You know, they'll have a meeting with you and say, this is great. You know, we want to do it. And these are just examples, uh, mm -hmm. these two networks that I mentioned, not necessarily real-life yeah, yeah. stories. Not necessarily. But maybe, <laughs> oh, maybe, maybe. <laughs> this, this is amazing. You know, we love this. This is going to be great. Like, we're going to do this. Then you talk to their boss. Like, what is this shit? And then they're like, let's talk again in a month. Then you talk to them in a month. And they're like, let's talk again in six months. Next thing you know, you got, you know, a couple thousand dollars left in the bank. Like, what do we, what do, we do? Yeah. You know, so yeah. How, 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 how frustrating did you, do you find that, the delay in, uh, in the business world compared to sport? You know, you don't get given, you're not afforded a lot of time when, when you make mistakes in sport and you have to react and you either turn around and fix them and do that quickly or you, uh, you probably get beat again and, and then maybe lose contracts or however it works within your sport. Did you find that frustrating within the sort of corporate or business world that these, some decisions just take ages? It's just like, it doesn't, I, I can't understand why some of them do take that long. Yeah, I, I think when I was less mature on the business side, I, I did find it frustrating. But to me, I mean, it's just the way it is. You have to accept that. Yeah, if you chase something down like that forever, I've seen entrepreneurs do that. They, like not accept these things and it's killed their companies. Right. Yeah. So there are businesses trying to do the exact same thing that we were trying to do at that time with a similar technology and they're still chasing it down. Yeah. So that's the key in a startup, I think, is they say you want to optimize for learning per unit of time. So you should constantly be building something, deploying it, seeing if it works, measuring it, and then using what you've measured to say, okay, what's next? Do we scale it? Do we add a feature? Do we do something completely new? So that's something that we did really well early on. And luckily for us, we got recognition for being good at that um, from some early stage investors that helped us get through because our business, it wasn't the type of business that's traditionally very attractive to um, a venture capital, you know, fund. They're looking for a lot of like business to business software companies, like you sell email automation or something like that, or, you know, even consumer companies, but something that they relate to more. Like we'd, we'd pitch a venture capitalist and like, you know, you're in Silicon Valley and like boxing, and like do people, people do this? Like, what about mm -hmm. golf? I golf, you know? And, you know, you had people back then saying, like, you know, why don't you just make the trackers work for basketball or baseball? And what they don't realize is that nobody goes to the baseball gym to do a baseball workout or boxing, even though it's a professional. It's like a niche, niche professional sport here in the U.S. It used to be the number one professional sport in the U.S., but it's, you know, the others have outgrown it, unfortunately. But even though it's, it's, it's a bit niche, it's... um one of the number one workout modalities in the U.S. for fitness. And I think martial arts fitness is number one in the world. Yeah. You know, wow. According yeah. to some data. Yeah. 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 Just you, you, you mentioned earlier that um, in your boxing career, there were so many kind of ups and downs um, and, and you have to get up time after time after time, kind of metaphorically as well as physically get up. Um, what are the big challenges that you find in business? Man, uh, there's too many to name, you know, if, if it were easy to grow a, a huge consumer company, you know, million, tens of millions, hundreds of millions, everybody would do it. To me, there's, there's just always something. Um, growth is, is a hell of a challenge, you know, at this stage, you know, you're always looking for new, uh, exciting things to jump on that don't get saturated. You got to remember, like, there's thousands and tens of thousands of businesses all chasing the same odds. So they all want Simon, they all want Tom's eyes, right? And when you have that many businesses chasing the same eyes to get attention, 
the marketplace. It gets very, very expensive, and you need to find ways to uh, stand out, serve those customers better, and get in front of them better. And that's definitely, mm -hmm. definitely a challenge, always. One of the things I was wondering, actually, because um, COVID challenged a lot of people, but in different ways. Uh, some people were challenged because their business was likely to shrink. Others were challenged because their business grew really rapidly. Um, what were your big challenges through COVID? I think they're the, they were the same across the uh, connected fitness industry. You're starting to see, you know, Peloton is the big, uh, the big, are you familiar with Peloton? It's big out here yeah, in the yeah. U.S. I think it expanded yeah. Yeah. the past couple of years. Yeah, it, definitely supply chains dried up. So then demand went through the roof, right? Your ability to service that demand got extremely difficult and the cost that you'd pay to service that demand got extremely expensive. So overnight, really, because we know this stuff, it hit us over the head and everything was happening really fast. Overnight, you, you had this, this problem of like, I have all this demand and it's really expensive to service it. And it's, I don't know when this is even going to end, right? A lot of people thought that it would never end. Peloton thought it would never end, apparently. Mm. So it was trying to plan for servicing that demand um, in an economical way. And it's expensive. So I think that was one of the difficulties. I, I think a lot of people thought COVID was a real boon for the industry of connected fitness. And at first, mm. it definitely appeared that way. But a lot of people are surprised when I tell them we grew more the year before COVID than we did the year of COVID, right? Which is a lot of people are like, wow, when I tell them that. And long term, for our industry, I think it's going to kill a lot of the new entrants. I think there's a lot of players out there that were like, either maybe they were in development a little bit before COVID or COVID was like, hey, we have to build a home fitness thing. Like, look at this. I think a lot of those players are going to die over the next year to two years. And if you look at what it did to Peloton, you're talking, this is the company that was sitting somewhere around a 55, 50, 55 billion dollar market cap. And I think they're sitting around three to 4 billion today. So, I mean, they got whacked. And a lot mm. of that had to do with like, how do you make these snap decisions really fast on something where you have zero insight? This has never happened before. And I have to make a decision for six months from now, a year from now, I don't know what the world's going to look like. And you know, a lot of these companies over planned on inventory and I think that hurt them. So it's been long term. I think it's actually negative for a connected fitness industry. How have, you, how have you guys been since, I mean, I know we're theoretically still suffering with the pandemic, but, but a lot of people are saying it's, it's past, it's gone, we moved on. How have you guys um, progressed since, um, you know, the harsh realities of pandemic? Great. Yeah. I mean, so I think the entire industry of connected fitness is facing a little bit of a headwind in terms of growth. So it just, you have to be really sly how you, you know, focus your energies. And on our end, you know, our exec team was really good at getting ahead of this and saying, okay, during this time, let's invest in product. Let's invest in some of these things that, you know, a year ago we weren't able to invest in because we were chasing down that demand that was there. And we're trying to figure out how we're going to get bags and trackers made and shipped and things like that. So the fact that it cooled down, I really think has refocused our team and Khalil, our CEO has us really hyper focused on how can we optimize the product to, you know, improve the entire overall experience, improve our unit economics and really prepare us because we're still only in the first, you know, the 48 states of the U S for the most part. Right. How do we prepare ourselves now, product-wise, logistics-wise, all these things, for when that headwind kind of dies down a little bit, which is just natural because there was so much demand built up. It's like the pendulum. It swings violently back and forth. Really uh, focus on our, on, on our product so that when we're ready in 12 to 18 months, we can start deploying in Canada, UK, Germany, Australia, and all these places. So we're really just prepping on that right now and focusing yeah, a lot brilliant. on the product. Brilliant. So yeah. Obviously, you'll have learned loads through your athletic career um, and uh, you'll have d developed characteristics. What do you think really helps you now in business? Which experiences or lessons particularly help you now? Yeah, you know, I think for me, a lot of these lessons help, a lot of them hurt. So like boxing is a very individualistic sport, very aggressive. And the best thing about coming up in boxing is that you learn how to sort of like fight through adversity and become optimistic in the face of adversity. 
you know, you have a, a fracture in your eye socket, but somehow you still think like, dude, I could be the best, right? Like, and, and you won't be successful unless you learn how to do that. So I'm very optimistic. Like there could be horrible things going on and I'm like, of course we're gonna figure this out, right? Um, and very aggressive at the way I chase things down. So I think those are very good characteristics that come from sport for sure. But I think, you know, it takes all types to start a business. And that's the one way that boxing, coming up as a boxer, differentiates from being a business owner is that in a business, you need a team. In boxing, mm -hmm. you need yourself, right? So I think uh, the, if we're talking about just fighting, fight sports, it's a superpower. To, to, if you're successful in fight sports at even a small degree, you can apply a lot of those things and, and be superhuman in business or in any other field that you want to be. But the best are going to have to adapt to, you know, what is different about business. So it's, it's about like leaning into those superpowers, but also being, being able to identify the weaknesses early on and focus on those two, learn how to be a team player. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Do you think that, any... um, that's a bit of a, do you think that's difficult for some of the, the other boxers that might not be, uh, I guess, as, as, as so adept, uh, adept at looking towards the future, towards your, your next career or whatever it might be, like as you were, clearly were. Um, what are your fears for many of the sort of boxers that are in the position that you found yourselves in? Are, you know, are they, are they preparing themselves for that transitional process enough or is it just all on black? Let's see what we go. Yeah, I mean, that's the, that's the archetype, right? Is that they're very um, risky people just inherently. That's why they're fighting other people in the first place. So, and a lot of them do fall in that, unfortunately. I think boxers and fighters out of all the other sports disciplines are the least prepared for the world, unfortunately. And I think in the U.S., I can speak to the U.S., it has a lot to do with infrastructure. So you're talking about boxing going back 100, 150 years was the sport in the U.S. And I just, I feel like the country was, was a bit more uh, rugged back then, individualistic, right? So, you know, Harvard University had a boxing team, right? Teddy Roosevelt, the president, had a boxing, he, he was part of the Harvard boxing team, he was the captain. And then when he became president, he had a boxing ring in the White House and they had to take it out because he was sparring with people and he got his eye uh, injured. That's why he had an eye patch as the, as the sitting president of the United States. So you think about like leaders these days, you know, I'm sorry, but Joe Biden. And, you There'd know, be a few um, people that want to get in with Boris, I'll tell you that. They're, they're not boxing in the, in the base of the White House anymore. Right? You know, it's the same thing with Boris, yeah. Um, so, you know... It's, it's been a shame to watch the, the infrastructure of boxing deteriorate over the years. I mean, I guess I'm too young. I didn't watch it, right? But I just know just because I know the history of boxing that it has. Now, USA Boxing, which is the governing body of, of boxing in the U.S., they're doing their best. They're very underfunded, though. So they're the national governing body of amateur boxing, which is our grassroots, right? And I know you have Team GB over there. Who, Team GB does an excellent job as well. But... You know, we don't have all the funding in the world, that's for sure. At USA Boxing, it's all privately funded in the U.S., so there's no government funding that goes into the Olympic programs, which, you know, it, it's cool, right? It, it, it's, it's amazing that they're still able to do as well as they, as they do. But I personally, I think it's a shame that we don't fund high school programs and collegiate programs anymore, and it's all because people are scared of... Um, you know, the safety aspects. That's why they stopped collegiate boxing, right? You know, somebody's going to get hurt. And to me, I think they're focusing on the wrong thing because I think it's more scary to think that we're not preparing our young men and women, because obviously it's, a, it's a, a woman's sport now, for adversity the way that we used to. I think it's actually the best thing, martial arts, that you could put a kid into at a young age because they're looking at, okay, now this kid's not going to, you know, get bopped in the head or whatever but they're also not going to learn some life lessons that are essential to success, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, is there anything that actually you've learned from business, which if you were to go back and be an athlete again, you would kind of take into your athletic preparation and, uh, you know, into your athletic mindset? Hmm. You know, 
I think that whole team mentality, like I talk about how boxing is a veg- very individualistic sport, and I think it's true. But one thing that I realized, one of our brand values at Fight Camp is empathy. And it was really important for us to reconcile all of our brand values that we wanted to have, our company values, with values that we see in the sports world. And I, I don't think I even realized how important that was in boxing until I was in business. And you might, you might think like, okay, because we have you know, boldness and courage, speed, focus, discipline. Um, these are all our, our brand values. And those make sense for fighters. You have to be courageous. You have to be fast and dedicated. How does empathy relate? And when you think about it, behind every great fighter is, is a great coach. And a great coach that can like step in, really understand that fighter, not talk about tactics. Like when he does this, you do that. Like understand that fighter emotionally. Right, to be able to give them the right message at the exact right time that they're ready to hear it. And then the, the opposite is also true. If you're gonna be a good student, you have to have empathy for your coach. You have to know exactly where they're coming from. You have to know they're not yelling at you because they're just like, you know, they have a temper or they're mad. They're trying to get something across to you. And if you can be open to that feedback, you're gonna learn a lot faster and a lot better. So I think that's probably the number one lesson that I've taken from business and I wish I knew earlier. Mm. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Uh, Tom, you have some uh, quick fire questions. Let's do it. Yeah, Bill, I'll try to make them as quick as possible. Depends how quickly I can read, I guess. Uh, if you hadn't been a professional ash- athlete, I can't read that well. Uh, <laughs> what would you have been? And is there another vocation that took your interest? Man, uh, so I'll tell you when I was a kid. <laughs> I was, this is another very risky endeavor here. I was really interested in, um, I, I thought I wanted to be a fighter pilot. You know, I wanted oh, to be yes. the air force, like top gun, you know, and I actually, um, I saved up some money as a kid working a little side job and I took flight lessons when I was a kid. I took like eight hours oh. in an airplane with an instructor, like a little Cessna. So that was fun. I think probably that, that would be it for me. The 100% I mean, having having seen well. Maverick, which is just, just as good as Top Gun. I yeah. mean, I'm still, I'm still wanting yeah. to be that guy. <laughs> yeah. so you got you watched it it was so good I yeah, yeah. It well, I loved it loved yeah it was it. Great. Mm-hmm. uh who is the person you most admire in sport and in business so in sport and i'll say as an athlete i really admire floyd mayweather because of how dominant he was a lot of people critique his persona and all these things um and and maybe they're justified in doing so i don't um i, I kind of understand it a little bit just because of where he comes from but as an athlete, wow, like the dedication, the confidence. I think that's another one of the attributes that's so important as a business person, as an entrepreneur and as an athlete. I used to say that God could come down himself from a cloud and do like miracles right in front of Floyd Mayweather, like so that Floyd Mayweather had no doubt in his mind that it was God. And he would tell Floyd Mayweather, hey, this fight coming up, you're going to lose. And Floyd Mayweather would argue him back up into the sky. Not to, <laughs> you know, the, the God would be like, oh, my God, I need to get away from that. <laughs> and he'd win. I like, so, yeah, I like it. I really admire that about Floyd. And then on the business side, Elon Musk. He's the entrepreneur of our generation. He's running three different, as far as I know, billion-dollar-plus amazing enterprises, including Tesla, which is changing the world, right? has the ability to. SpaceX, which has the ability to change the world in so many ways, whether it be being the first to go to Mars or Starlink, which is providing um, internet access to people all across the world where they wouldn't have had it. And, you know, it's funny because China is really um, nervous about Starlink because it gives individuals the ability to have internet access outside of state control power. So I think it's one of the most important companies out there right now. Um, you know, he's looking at Twitter too, from what, from what I understand. So like being able to operate one business like that is hard. I can, I can speak to it and we're not even at the level of any of these businesses. And we have a co-founding team of six people that are really passionate, but being able to have all of those companies that are that significant and operate them the way that he does, he's really good at putting the right people in the right places and, um, inspiring people to do their best job. I think he's the best entrepreneur of our age. For sure. mm. Great stuff. Next one. You have some funds to invest. What would you invest it in? So I've become, re- I, don't, I don't have a very, very specific company, but I've become really interested in longevity. 
right? I think this is like one of the most important things. Uh, there's a lot going on right now at uh, you know Harvard and MIT right now, um, and you know whether it be like stem cell research, the stuff they're doing with like NAD for life expansion, like even CRISPR gene editing, things like that. I think are gonna. So I am an investor in CRISPR on the public market. It's a great company. And things like that really interest me. It's where I want to put my focus. Like I say, like, so, you know, I'm a co-founder of Fight Camp. I've always been interested in fitness. I'm also advising two fitness companies. One of them is called Flexia. It's the first ever connected Pilates reformer. Another one is um, it's called Ergata. It's a rower that's very gamified. It's a great company. And then I'm an investor in a company called Elo Health, E-L-O. And they're doing the first ever... It's a supplement subscription that's tied to blood tests because as an athlete, you know, this is that you don't need to eat the same thing as somebody else. Your body type is very, very different than every single other other person's body type, right? So we need different things and we need different things at different times. So the ability to look inside your body, get some data and then be like, all right, this is the supplement that I need. And this is the dosage. I think it's, it could be a, you know, a huge opportunity for people. So I've kind of feel like where I want to focus my time as an entrepreneur is in this, this idea of like human performance optimization. And that's why I'm really interested in that, in that field. So. I like that. I'm going to have a look that up afterwards. Um, yeah. Okay. You can only watch, okay, it might be Top Gun or Maverick given what you just said. You can only watch one film for the rest of your life. What would it be? Man, that's a tough one for me. That's a really good <laughs> I'll tell you, if I could choose um, a director, I love the Coen brothers. One of my favorite films has to be uh, No Country for Old Men. It was also one of my favorite books. Brilliant movie. I don't think I could watch it for the rest of my life, though. <laughs> what, maybe maybe <laughs> just a movie. What's your answer? I'm interested. Well, I'm, I actually think it'd be, it'd be nothing too intellectual. I, 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 love, I love Top Gun. I could have watched that time and time again. But one of our guests came up with a brilliant answer the other day one that caught me completely sideways and he just went well it'd have to be groundhog day right oh, so right. uh it, like he just outwitted me completely which is not you know it's not the first time it's happened but uh, i thought it was a great <laughs> answer i feel um, like we were all living in that through covid it felt like groundhog uh, day. yeah it was uh after. not a good time my, my kids have been uh, my kids have been ill recently and i was uh i was sat in the garden with my with my wife the other day and she said this is like being back in covid because the mm. kids weren't at school, and it was like, oh my god, we got we got to stop doing this. We need to get out of the house. It's yeah. a scary, scary sort of thing. But um, sure. provided opportunities and, and enabled us to, to reconnect, no doubt. Mm-hmm. I, well, I hope they're feeling better, man. Oh yeah. Well, they haven't had a choice. Back to school. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, t- teach them a bit of resilience. Yeah. That's the that's the way. Get back to school. Exactly. Um, You're not that ill. You're not that ill. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, Thank you very much, Tom May. Huge thank you, Tommy. Absolutely brilliant. Uh, fantastic conversation uh, and loads of real great insights in there. So uh, that's the end of another episode. Uh, we look forward to seeing you guys very soon. Uh, thank you very much. Join us again for another episode of the Podium Podcast. <laughs>